Good afternoon. I am Lauren Strauss, scholar in residence and director of undergraduate studies for American University's Jewish Studies program. I am delighted to welcome you to the fourth and final webinar in our new series on Europe's Jews before the Holocaust, where we have been spotlighting the authors of four important new books on this theme. Our series is co-sponsored by AU's Jewish Studies program and our series and, and our Center for Israel Studies with the very generous support of the Knapp Family Foundation. I especially want to thank, as always, the Center for Israel Studies Managing Director, Laura Cutler, for making all that we do possible. It's a special treat for all of us today that this conversation features the directors of both of today's sponsoring programs, Professor Michael Brenner, Director of the Center for Israel Studies and Professor Pamela Nadell, Director of the Jewish Studies Program. Everyone at American University joins me in extending a warm welcome to our audience, which includes people from around the world, friends of AU and our Jewish Studies Program and our Center for Israel Studies, alumni and academic colleagues from many institutions, and of course, our own students. I particularly want to welcome the students who are joining today who are currently enrolled in Dr. Nadell's class on Holocaust history and Dr. Andrew Demchuk's class, Modern Europe uh, Habits of Mind, and my own students in my Modern Jewish Civilization class. One more academic note, lest you think that this is your last opportunity to join us this semester for a webinar, never fear. On March 15th, we are inaugurating a new series, very exciting series on modern Israeli authors with the first event in that series being the uh, world famous David Grossman on Tuesday, March 15th, followed by three more very exciting Israeli authors. And uh, we'll be putting in the chat the link to sign up for those. And now it is my absolute pleasure to introduce today's moderator. Professor Pamela Nadell holds the Patrick Clendenin Chair in Women's and Gender History at American University, where she directs the Jewish Studies Program. She also received the university's highest honor, Scholar Teacher of the Year. She is a past president of the Association for Jewish Studies, was a member of the founding historians team for what is now the Weizmann or Weizmann National Museum of American Jewish History in Philadelphia. And her most recent book, America's Jewish Women, A History from Colonial Times to Today, won the 2019 National Jewish Book Awards Jewish Book of the Year. She has told me that she takes great pride in her many contributions to American University, but among her greatest contributions, Dr. Nadell uh, counts the uh, being on the search committee that found Michael Brenner and brought him and his wonderful wife, Michelle Anger, to teach at our campus. And I couldn't agree with her more. I'm delighted to now turn the virtual microphone over to Professor Nadell to introduce Professor uh, Brenner and begin our conversation. Thank you, Dr. Strauss, for that wonderful introduction. Um, let me uh, in introduce Professor Brenner, and we will follow the format that we've been having all along. He will give us a presentation for about 35 or 40 minutes. Um, then he and I are going to have a chance to have conversation about his wonderful new book, and then I will be sending him questions that you've posted in the Q&A. Um, so I, I also want to extend my deep appreciation to Laura Cutler for all the work that she does to make these wonderful webinars um, available. So let me tell you a little bit about Professor Brennan. He's the Seymour and Lillian Abenson Chair in Israel Studies and, as you heard, Director of the Center for Israel Studies. He also holds the Chair of Jewish History and Culture at Ludwig Maximilians University, which is in Munich, and he is the International President of the Leo Beck Institute for the Study of German Jewish History. He has been awarded the Order of Merit by the Federal Republic of Germany and two years ago became the first recipient ever of the Salo W. and Jeanette M. Barone Award for Scholarly Excellence in Research on the Jewish Experience. 
And now I have the extraordinary privilege of announcing to everyone that Professor Brenner has also just been appointed Distinguished Professor at American University. This is a rank reserved exclusively for the most exceptional scholars, those who have completely transformed their fields. His books in, uh, that have been translated into more than a dozen languages, his hundreds of articles, book chapters, and journalism have left their mark on Jewish history from antiquity to the present. And so it is a wonderful privilege to congratulate him, as I'm sure everybody watching does. And we are very excited that today he is talking about his latest book in Hitler's Munich, Jews, the Revolution, and the Rise of Nazism. It will be officially published later this month, um, but you may even be able to get some signed copies, I understand, at one of our preeminent local bookstores. So welcome, Professor Brim. Thank you so much, uh, both to Lauren and Pam for these wonderful uh, and more, most generous introductions. It's really a privilege uh, being your colleague here at American University. Um, uh, when I wrote the book, I did not know how timely it would be. And now I must say um, on two different levels. First of all, um, I wrote it a couple of years ago, first in German then in English. And it, um, well, I did not foresee that after January 6th of last year, there would be certain, um, analogies to American history. We can discuss that later uh, when we discuss insurrections, when we discuss what happens after insurrections. And the second one now is uh, really happening in these very sad days where all of our thoughts are uh, with the people of Ukraine. And interestingly, um, there is of course a Jewish pr president of Ukraine and um, that's not such a usual story for a European country to have, or for any country to have a Jewish president. But our story actually starts with a Jewish prime minister. And I will share my screen to show you some of the illustrations. So we start in the year 1918, with the end of World War I. Uh, what you see here at the top left is actually the uh, large um, meadow in front of the so-called Bavaria statue. That's where the Oktoberfest takes place every year. But on uh, November, not, on November 7th, 1918, that was the scene for two separate demonstrations to end the war, to end World War I in Munich. And the larger demonstration was that of, a, of the main social democratic party. And then there was a smaller demonstration, a smaller protest group uh, organized by the so-called independent social democrats. Those had been formed uh, a, a few years during the war to end the war. And um, at the head of this smaller demonstration was Kurt Eisner, a Jewish journalist from Berlin. And while the majority social democrats went home that night, went to bed and uh, woke, and then they woke up next morning, uh, no longer in a monarchy with the king at, at its top, but with Kurt Eisner, the, the independent social Democrat, now at the head of the, the new Bavarian state, the free state of Bavaria. So while the majority went home, the smaller group around Eisner went into the uh, city center and they encountered no resistance when they approached the castle, when they approached the barracks of the soldiers, and they figured out that the soldiers and everybody was just, uh, they had enough of the war, but they also had enough of the monarchy. And even two days before the Kaiser, the emperor, 
was toppled in Berlin, the Bavarian king um, fled Munich. We have the description of the palace administrator who later wrote, when the most sovereign gentleman had left the residence, I shut the windows in the royal palace, helped extinguish the lights, and after the officiant on duty and the footman who had no further instructions had left, I closed all the doors and made my way to the chapel courtyard. That's how the revolution happened in Germany. Not a single person was hurt or killed. Uh, the people went to bed with the king and they woke up with this gentleman, Kurt Eisner, a Prussian, a Jew and a socialist, all three things not taken for granted in conservative Bavaria, who founded the free state of Bavaria. And I'm starting my book with the revolution for the obvious reason that many Jews were very active in the revolution. And that's what was of course noticed both inside the Jewish community, but even more so outside. Immediately after he became prime minister of the state of Bavaria, which was of course part of Germany, but they had their autonomy. He was, for example, also the foreign minister of Bavaria. Immediately after that, he became also the target of anti-Semitic attacks. And um, in fact, a, um, uh, one of the most depressing archival findings in connection with the revolution in Munich when I, when I researched for the book was a bundle of two thick files with hundreds of anti-Semitic hate letters against Eisner, which contain frequent incitements to violence. For example, there is a postcard addressed to the Hebrew residents and a letter to the King of the Jews in which it says, control yourself or disappear to the country where you belong, to Palestine. The broad masses of the German people will eradicate you, some, something one person can accomplish. And so on and so on. He was called a Jew pig, a dirty Jew, and an uncircumcised scum Jew. It, I, I'd rather spare you all the other terms. Uh, he was called a little dirty Jewish Polish schnorrer. And um, in fact, his name, the legend that he was, his real name was not Eisner, but something East European like Kuszynski and Ko or Kozmanowski or Krushnovsky, all of those names that remained very present even after World War II. Sometimes you could find references among quite serious historians who said, oh, he was actually from Galicia. Uh, he was born in Berlin. He was a German Jew. He had lived in Munich for many years. Um, and in fact, as one person said, uh, as I just uh, read, it, um, um, it, it, it is enough for one person to um, get rid of you. That's what happened. Only three months after he became prime minister of Bavaria, he was assassinated on February 21st of 1919. You can see on the top left, the um, kind of a memorial at, his, at the site where he was assassinated. He was in fact on the way to the Bavarian parliament to resign because in the elections, which he had called in January of 1919, his party had lost. And um, he had his letter of resignation in his pocket when his assassin, came from behind, shot him. He was a 20-year-old Count von Arco. Now, the interesting story for, for our uh, account is that Count Arco's mother was a nay Oppenheim and came from a Jewish, although Baptist Jewish family. And this young uh, person, Count Arco, tried to join one of the very right-wing new emerging organizations in Munich, but he was not let in because he didn't have the area, the pure Aryan background they demanded. So one of the 
reasons why he shot the Jewish prime minister was in fact to prove to his fellow right-wing comrades that he should belong to this organization. And there are many of those stories where you find people of Jewish background in all sides, not just among the revolutionaries. Uh, on the top right, you see the, um, the funeral uh, um, of, the, uh, of Kurt Eisner, which was the largest gathering of people in the city of Munich recorded uh, until then. Uh, they say, the, the, the newspaper at the time said about 100,000 Jews followed the Jewish prime minister who was assassinated. And it is actually quite interesting when you look at, uh, I would say, um, exceptional occasions in German Jewish history to um, remind us on this day of his funeral, February 26 of 1919, um, this, the, his uh, funeral took place on Munich's Ostfriedhof on the, on the cemetery. Um, there was the Jewish prime minister and the main speaker to mourn him was another Jewish speaker, his fellow revolutionary, Gustav Landauer. And in his eulogy, uh, Landauer told the crowd, and I'm, I quote from his speech, Kurt Eisner, the Jew, was a prophet because he sympathized with the poor and downtrodden and saw the opportunity and the necessity of putting an end to poverty and subjugation. So quite remarkable on this, September, on this, on this February day of 1919, a Jewish speaker mourns a Jewish prime minister in the state of Bavaria and recalls him as a Jew and an heir to the prophets. Now, um, there is indeed a Jewish dimension to this revolution, and it is different from the revolutions in Berlin, where you had a Rosa Luxemburg, or in Russia, where you, of course, had a Trotsky, or even Budapest in Hungary, where you had Bela Kuhn and, and quite a few other Jewish revolutionaries. But in Munich, almost all of the leading faces of that revolution happened to be Jewish. Not only that, some of them, like Gustav Landauer, the very close associate of Eisner, who held this eulogy, um, was very active uh, in expressing his interest in Jewish culture. He was, of course, none of them were religious or member of a religious congregation, but they did not deny their Judaism. And he was a very close friend, Gustav Landauer, of the most important Jewish philosopher at the time, Martin Buber. In fact, in December of 1918, while Landauer was, a, was part of this new governing elite around uh, Kurt Eisner, Landau wrote to Buber, who was in Berlin at the time, dear Buber, a very fine theme, the revolution and the Jews. Make sure to treat the leading part the Jews have played in the upheaval. Now, Buber did not treat it, did not write the story. In fact, nobody wrote that story. So I, I thought it is worth starting the book about post-war Munich, which of course will lead to very different stories soon, with a Jewish story, with a story Gustav Landauer had told Martin Buber to do. Buber in turn uh, came to visit Landauer in Munich in February of 1919, and he happened to leave the city at the day that Eisner was assassinated. Um, he writes to his uh, close acquaintance and later son-in-law Ludwig Strauss, the whole thing is an unspeakable Jewish tragedy. And of course, other observers noticed the presence of Jews too, because before that, Jews were not able to have any high-ranking functions in a Jewish government, sorry, in a German government. Um, the, Thomas Mann, the famous German writer who was not Jewish but married to a woman from a 
very assimilated Jewish family. Uh, Thomas Mann wrote in his diary one day after Eisner um, came to power, both Munich and Bavaria governed by Jewish scribblers. How long will the city put up with that? And in fact, uh, it didn't. But before we go to the reaction and the next phase, um, let's go to act two of the revolution. So after Eisner was assassinated, um, for a short period in, April, in uh, April of 1919, there were two short-lived Soviet, or maybe we should say council republics. Soviet is the Russian word for council. And uh, they were led also by a number of uh, Jewish intellectuals. Here is Landauer again, and, and you know, Ernst Toller became a very well-known writer. Erich Musam, another writer. Um, and in the second phase of the, now in the last phase of this council republic or Soviet republic, we actually have now a communist phase led by Eugen Levine, a Moscow born um, uh, Jewish revolutionary. Um, this was the situation in Munich uh, in late 1918 and 19 and the first half of 1919. Now, how did the Jewish community of Munich view all that? Well, you probably can imagine they did not jubilate and say, finally, we have the possibility that Jews are also able to become important politicians and even a prime minister in our state. They were scared. They were scared for two reasons. First of all, the vast majority of Munich's Jews were not socialists or communists. Actually, many of them were monarchists and were not so happy to see the king go, but others were centrist, liberal politicians, lib uh, voted for liberal parties, for center parties, but not necessarily for the left-wing socialist parties. Um, and they knew something which they had learned from Russia. Uh, there the saying made, was well known, the Trotskys make the revolution and the Bronsteins pay the price for it. As you know, Bronstein, of course, was the name of Trotsky. And it was the Jews who ha often had to pay the price for the revolutionaries. Uh, because many people equated Jews with revolutionaries um, with the radical left. And the same happened in Munich. Uh, the Jewish community was scared. They thought, if this doesn't go well, it's us, it's the Jewish community who will have to pay the price for it. And you see how much established this Jewish community was even from the picture here. This is the main synagogue in Munich uh, and uh, the symbol of the city, the dome, the cathedral in the back. Uh, both of those buildings were pretty prominent in the city, uh, not just the, the churches, but also the big synagogue. So the leader of the Orthodox uh, community within Munich there was a mainstream, larger liberal community, or uh, today we would say reformed conservative, uh, and a smaller Orthodox community. And the leader of the Orthodox community, a very um, respected businessman in Munich, Sigmund Frankel, um, he um, went uh, to the main newspaper of Munich with a letter in his pocket. Um, which he wanted to be published in the newspaper, in which he distanced himself from the leaders of this revolution. Uh, he, he, he ends it with this, with these sentences, the Bavaria's indigenous Jews shout out by way of me to Bavaria's population. Our hands are clean of the horrors of chaos and of the misery and suffering that your politics must conjure up over Bavaria's future development. You alone, and he means the Jewish revolutionaries, you alone and only you bear full responsibility for this. 
So you can already see, and this is one example, there are many others in the same files, by the way, where there are anti-Semitic letters to Kurt Eisner, the short-lived prime minister. There are also letters from Jews saying, you should not become prime minister. You should resign because it will endanger us. He actually took the time to reply to a few of them. We have at least one reply, which I uh, found where he says, well, uh, you really think I care about my family background? I have important things to do in this state as a Bavarian politician. Um, so he says, you know, that's not, not, uh, nothing I care about. Uh, that was the situation in 1918-19. Uh, and I, I, I go into all of this detail because it's important to understand how present the, uh, what people would call then the Jewish question or Jewish issues or just Jewish politicians were in the newspapers, in the street talk of Munich in 1919. The revolution failed, it toppled, uh, Landauer was brutally murdered uh, on May 2nd, 1919. Levine was ex executed, others ended up in prison. Um, and we have, after a short uh, transition period of a social democratic prime minister, uh, we have now a conservative reaction, or if you want a conservative revolution, in 1920. With this person, Gustav von Kahr, the, uh, the, the person to the lower right, um, becoming prime minister and becoming the main figure in Bavaria for the next few years. Um, his memoirs of over a thousand pages are not published, but uh, they, they are in the Munich archives, and they are actually full of anti-Semitic uh, references, starting with his up, the way he was educated and grew up, um, but also um, when it comes to Eisner, for example, he says the Bavarian people was letting itself be enticed and terrorized by the Prussian Jew and his clan. And of course, what he means with this is uh, this whole Jewish clan. Um, we will come back to Gustav von Kahr in a minute, but the other person who was probably mm, as important in Munich, not just during the 20s, but until his death in the late 1950s, uh, was the Archbishop, later Cardinal Michel or Michael Fallhaber. And Fallhaber too, we just discovered a few years ago, long after, decades after his death, that he actually had written um, uh, diaries. And in these diaries, we also see a lot of the more traditional anti-Jewish, uh, uh, the, the Christian anti-Judaism. Um, and when Eisner, a Jew, becomes prime minister, um, he writes, it is not the same whether the people look up to a king with trust and a sense of religious obligation, or whether they say, what does this Jew have to do with us? And so what he expresses is the feelings of many there is a Jewish person cannot have authority over a mainly Catholic people in Bavaria. Uh, and, and there are many other similar remarks we found from Faulhaber in later years as well. What becomes clear in Munich in the early 1920s is that anti-Semitism now um, is not just obvious in street violence, in uh, swastikas that you see now across the city uh, and, and in other uh, expressions of Jew anti-Jewish hatred, but it's also becoming part of the major institutions. And that becomes important because where do Jews go to if they are attacked? Well, you would say they go to, you know, to the courts. Um, the problem was that the courts were, the judges were known as people called it at the time, blind on their right eye. Um, they were very harsh when it came uh, to convict leftist um, radicals. 
those who tried to attack the state from the left. But when it came to the extreme right, they were extremely lenient. For example, the assassin of Kurt Eisner, the Count Arco, he got away, first of all, you know, it was clear he admitted he shot him and there was no doubt about it. And according to the law, he had actually to be punished with the death penalty. Uh, the next day that was transformed into life sentence. And after only a few years, Arco was already uh, a free man again and freed from prison. And that was the case with many other uh, right-wing radicals. They got very mild sentences. The police, well, you see this sent gentleman to the right standing with von Carr. This is the prime minister. This is the the, the, the police president, Perna. Mr. Perna was one of the very first national socialists in town, um, supporters of Adolf Hitler, we'll speak about him, of course, in a minute. And he um, marched with Hitler in the Beer Hall Putsch in 1923. At that time, he was no longer police president, but he was police president already in 1919, actually. And it was known that he was anti-Semitic as well as the, as the head of the political police in Munich who would later become uh, the Minister of the Interior in the first Hitler government in 1933. So the police was also known to be anti-Semitic and the politicians, uh, we will see in a moment, people like Carr, uh, were quite active in not in this radical Nazi-like anti-Semitism, but for example, in measures against East European Jews living in Bavaria. And as I mentioned already, the church you would also think would come to the help. And in fact, the Munich chief rabbi often went to the cardinal, to Mr. Fallhaber, and he thought he had his support, but now reading his diaries, of, of the Cardinal, we know he did not have his support. As I mentioned, uh, the, among the Jewish population of Munich, we're talking about a relatively small community, 12,000 Jews in Munich compared to 170,000 in Berlin. There were 12,000 Jews in Munich. About a quarter of them had recently come from Eastern Europe. And the moment Mr. von Karr became prime minister, he already tried for the first time to expel not all, but all of those Easter European Jews, meaning Jews who didn't have a German citizenship, uh, to, to expel those who had some records of, uh, you know, having police records or whatever, uh, 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 had, uh, those who had uh, uh, actually were successful and had become um, had assembled some wealth, they would have been suspicious of being uh, war profiteers, whatever reasons they could find uh, to put the East European Jews on the list to be expelled. And again, where would they go? They couldn't go to the police, to the courts, to the church. Uh, they felt they didn't really, they really weren't heard. In fact, the one place that in the end helped them not to be expelled um, were the foreign diplomats in the city, the consuls, um, not because they loved Jews so much, but the Austrian consul and the Polish consul, they feared, reflecting the view of their governments, that those Jews would be expelled into their countries, and they didn't like that. So in the end, the Polish government and the Austrian government said, well, if you expel our citizens, Polish Jews or Austrian Jews, we will expel Bavarian citizens to your country. So they uh, basically um, were reluctant. And by the way, very interesting findings also in the National Archives here in the US uh, about from, the Bavar from the US consulate in Munich, because many American Jews of German background uh, intervened with the Secretary of State when these attempts happened and also when street violence against Jews happened in Munich. And they would write, the state's Secretary of State would write to the, to the German, uh, to the um, American ambassador in Berlin and he would write to the Consul General in Munich. But you also see a lot of anti-Semitism within 
the um, um, state uh, department and many of the stereotypes of Jews as war profiteers, or they're all socialists and revolutionaries were reflected in this correspondence among American diplomats as well. Um, we're coming now to uh, the person who, of course, now becomes uh, one of the more uh, or most dominant figures in the city of Munich in the early 1920s already. You see Adolf Hitler here during World War I as a soldier. He had moved to Munich um, just before World War I. And then, of course, he was a soldier during the war. He returned um, in the end, uh, after the uh, end of the war, late 1918, to the city. He returned to a city uh, which now had all these Jewish socialist leaders. The truth is we don't know what Hitler's political views were exactly when he returned from the war. Um, he, we don't know it because he didn't write them down back then. He didn't give any speeches back then. He didn't publish anything in 1918 or early 1919. In fact, there are some historians who think he was sympathetic in early 1919 to some of the socialist uh, um, revolutionary circles that, 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 that were dominant. But we don't know that either. What we know is that by the end of 1919, he now had expressed himself the first time. He now became a radical right-wing and anti-Semitic uh, speaker. And um, he was the one who in 1921 basically became the um, sole leader of a party founded in 1919 as the uh, uh, first, but then renamed in 1920 as the National Socialist, um, uh, National Social Democratic uh, 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 Workers' Party in Germany. And, and uh, sorry, as, an, as the National Socialist Workers' Party in Germany. Uh, and um, and usually we refer to it as the Nazi party. Uh, and, and he became so dominant in the early 1920s that Thomas Mann, now we encounter, encounter this famous writer again, um, already in June of 1923, before the Beer Hall Putsch even, called Munich the city of Hitler. That's quite remarkable. He actually did that in an article he published in America in English. A few years later, looking back on the early and mid twenties, uh, Thomas Mann uh, painted the contrast of Munich as the liberal city of Germany before World War I in contrast to the more conservative Prussian Berlin how it changed from this liberal city into, as he called it, uh, a, as a, from a center of cheerful sensuality, artistry, and joie de vivre to a city decried as a hotbed of reaction, as the seed of all stubbornness, a city that could only be described as a stupid city, and indeed, as the stupidest city of all. That's what the resident of Munich Thomas Mann wasn't born in Munich, but he lived in Munich for many years by then, uh, called Munich in 1926. And I'm coming to our uh, final part. Um, 1923 proved to be a year of radicalization, rapid radicalization. We hear of a lot of anti-Semitic attacks in the streets of Munich, but mainly the right-wing forces around Hitler now, being the lead, seen already as the leader of these right-wing forces, mobilize and try to establish Munich as kind of a testing ground, as a laboratory for the rise of this new movement. Hitler tried out a lot of things. Uh, in, the, in the time before this beer hall putsch, which took place in November of 1923, um, which would return 10 years later when he became finally the chancellor of Germany. Um, and 
it seems he was not really um, called to risk, you know, to pay for them. He people seem to go along uh, with his anti-Semitic rhetoric and even action in 1923. Um, there were, and we can go into some details in the discussion, uh, many incidents in this year, people were um, some, actually this the same person, Sigmund Frankel, whom I mentioned before, the leader of Orthodox Jewry, really well-known personality in the city, who had come out so strongly against the Jewish revolutionaries, and, you know, our hands are free of the blood of those Jewish revolutionaries, this same person, this Orthodox conservative Jewish um, merchant was beaten up on the streets of Munich in 1923, uh, his wife and his son as well. By the way, his son, um, actually his name was Adolf Frankel, but he called himself later Abraham Frankel. Uh, when he uh, emigrated to Israel, he later became the uh, rector uh, or the provost of the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. He was a mathematics professor. So the Frankel family uh, was beaten up in the streets of Munich. And um, uh, there was a movie, um, Nathan the Wise. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's, it's the German uh, parable for religious tolerance written by the 18th century German enlightened non-Jewish writer uh, Lessing, uh, the movie made after made on the basis of this play uh, could not be performed in the theaters of Munich in January of 1923. It actually ran quite successfully in Berlin, but in Munich, the Nazi party threatened the movie theater owners that they would destroy their theaters if they ran the movie and, and, and basically after one tried it, that's what they did and nobody tried it again. That was the situation. That was the, the climate in Munich already in early 1923. Um, now, Hitler um, then on November 8th of 1923, uh, marched into a beer hall together with his closest supporters into a beer hall where uh, the strongman of Bavaria, Gustav von Kahr, was giving a speech. And there are different accounts what exactly happened at that day of this, of this beer hall putsch. Um, Hitler and von Kahr and von Kahr's closest associates, they, they disappeared in a back room. They came back and they all came back together and said they are staging the German revolution and basically copying Mussolini's march on Rome, they would march on Berlin. That's how it looked like in the beer hall putsch in the, that night in, in, in this, it's, this is the beer hall. This is not the photograph from that night uh, with the swastika flags that is a later uh, event, uh, but the same beer hall in Munich. So you have thousands of people in there and um, Von Kahr later said he was forced with a pistol uh, that he would go along with Hitler. But the next morning, um, Von Kahr turned against Hitler and Hitler and, 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 and um, many of his already SA troopers and other supporters um, were actually um, uh, taken down. Hitler was uh, hurt. He, actually dislocated his shoulder uh, uh, on that day. He fled the city, but was caught later and was, of course, uh, um, accused of treason against he had tried to topple the Bavarian government and the German government. He got away with the most lenient sentence of uh, basically one year, but even one year in prison was not very harsh. This is a picture of him in his prison with all of his supporters, among them Rudolf Hess, his later deputy. And that's, I think, what we really have to keep in mind. Um, the right-wing courts were so lenient and all of Hitler's supporters were so sure uh, you know, we can come back. And the mainstream didn't take him seriously enough. They didn't take him seriously enough. He was uh, 
a few years later, he was um, back in politics. He was running again. Um, he ran a few times for a chancellor, for president, didn't succeed. But in 1933, 10 years later, the president, the aged president and the World, World War I hero, uh, General Hindenburg, had, had appointed Hitler Reich Chancellor. And 10 years later, he had reached um, the goal, the, all of the goals he had in mind in 1923. Um, many of the Munich Jews and uh, other opponents of Hitler had, were sure that in 1924, the danger was averted. Was averted. Hitler was uh, in prison for at least a while, and he would not come back. And of course, they were really uh, wrong. And I think uh, from our perspective today, that is really uh, the tragic and the tragedy that the person who clearly uh, staged an insurrection, wanted to topple the German government in 1923, could got away uh, with this uh, light sentence and was able then to be appointed in a democratic way, by the way, uh, uh, the chancellor of Germany. So that's where I will stop. And um, it's really, um, and I, I just try to show the, to, to show this very complicated history, starting with the first Jewish prime minister ever of a German state, and by the way, almost the last one too, um, starting on this kind of enthusiastic note of a Jew can become prime minister um, with the change into a very reactionary government and finally the rise of the extreme right wing in the same place, in the same city of Munich. Thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. You really captured the book in, uh, in a, a striking way. And um, before I start to have a conversation with you about questions, we do have a number of questions that are coming into the Q&A. Let me invite our audience to continue to pose questions. So I actually, my first question for you is actually a reflection of what I've been seeing in the entire series. When Jeffrey Weidlinger spoke about the pogroms in the Ukraine um, during the Russian Civil War and the Polish-Ukrainian um, War, he, he, it was clear that there was a very powerful personal connection. He actually showed us videos of interviews that he had done 20 years earlier with survivors of those pogroms. When Natalia Alexian talked about the Polish Jewish historians who had founded an entire field in the nine, you know, in between World War One and World War Two, it was clear that she had a very personal connection because she's a Polish Jewish historian, and you're from Munich, and you founded the Jewish Studies Program at the university. You've taught there for many, many years, and I'm just curious about your personal connection to the subject. Yeah, that's interesting. So I, I've been teaching Munich for 25 years. Uh, actually, it's the, the origins of of the book go back even further. I, I, I don't know if I ever mentioned that to you, Pam. Uh, I, 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 I started writing my master's thesis. Uh, oh God, uh, over 30 years ago, um, on the Jewish revolutionaries. In the end. I didn't. I changed the topic about about something different, but I always it always stayed there, and 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 it came back, um, and that was before I was in, lived in Munich, and I it came back um, a few years ago when I thought if I don't write it now I'll never write it because the the, the hundredth anniversary came up of the revolution in Munich, and that was a huge thing in the city of Munich. I mean, every day for, for months, actually, there were events on it. It was really a big uh, thing in, in, in Munich. And so I started to write the history of these revolutionaries because they interested me also as Jewish, some of them as Jewish thinkers. Um, but I thought that's only a small part of the story. You can't stop in 1919 when many of them were killed or imprisoned, then it's the other side. Then it's the rise of the Iraq. And that's where Hitler was. That's where Hitler became Hitler as a politician. 
So that's how my personal connection to the story started. But of course, living in Munich for many years and still being there part of the year um, mm, makes you uh, relate to all of these events very differently. And after all, Munich is a pretty small, you know, it's a, a city of over a million people, but uh, but it's it's pretty small and you can walk everything or bike everything. So all of those sites where Eisner was assassinated, um, where, the, where the, the, the spear hall doesn't exist anymore, uh, but, but where that was, where the Oktoberfest uh, takes place, where the revolution really started, it's all there. And as, as you can imagine, when you walk around these places, um, they, they become very present, but the, in the consciousness of the people, that first part, that there was a Jewish prime minister, that there were these Jewish revolutions, that is not very, was not very much present. Of course, the Hitler part is very much present. Well, I, I know what you mean about how you've invited me to Munich and I come and I see, I see you know, the buildings that you're showing in many of those slides. And so you're right that, it, that you're, you're physically in that space and it's always present. And it's interesting how you, you said that originally you wanted to write about some of the of these revolutionaries as thinkers. Of course, I know your work on Jewish historiography so well. And one of the things that really struck me when I read the book is that in a sense, your presentation of the different revolutionaries is almost like a microcosm of the response to modernity of German Jewry, because you have, you have you have the, the revolutionaries, you have those who go to the far left, but you also, I mean, if we also talk about their opponents, you have the Orthodox community, the reform community, um, you, have, you have this struggle in, in this very short time period over what it means to be a Jew in the modern world. Could you comment? Yes, you're so right. And so I always talk about the Jewish revolutionaries, but there were, as you say, it was a mirror of the, you know, of a modern Jewish community that in many ways felt Jewish and German and Bavarian at the same time. And you have Jews on all sides of the political action. So I already mentioned this, you know, kind of monarchist conservative a Jew who goes to the newspaper and publishes a letter uh, against the Jewish revolution because he's conservative. Um, you have, um, uh, you have a, another person who I think is the most important, totally forgotten uh, actor in Munich politics in the early 1920s. He was the, basically, he wasn't the official editor, but the decisive person uh, behind the main um, daily newspaper in Munich. Um, his name was Kosman, Nicolas Kosman. He was a convert. He was born a Jew, but became, he became a Christian and he became quite an anti-Semite and very conservative. He turned that paper from a liberal to a very conservative paper. He was very instrumental in propagating the so-called back in the stab legend where it was Jews and socialists who were responsible for Germany losing uh, World War I. And he was an incredible, he was an intellectual, he was very conservative and very influential in Munich in the early 20s. The irony is that this person, Kosman, uh, of course, in 1933, when Hitler came to power, he, uh, he was not a, he didn't even try to become a Nazi supporter. He hated Hitler, but he was very conservative. So Hitler got, you know, rid of him and uh, the Nazis got rid of him. And he ended, his life ended in Theresienstadt and he became, he died as a Jew again. So this was another person. So you have the whole spectrum from the communist Levine, who by the way, was buried on the Jewish cemetery in Munich and the Orthodox monarchist rabbi, uh, sorry, not Orthodox, the, the, the kind of conservative, uh, but, con but, but conservative also politically rabbi, gave the eulogy, had to speak, he, uh, to, to, to Levine, he was executed as a communist, but he's buried at the Jewish cemetery in Munich. And you have the whole spectrum to the more moderate Eisner, to the, uh, to, 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 to like the, 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 the center politicians, to the right wingers, everyone there. 
And, um, and can I say one more thing? Of because course. That, that's, though I, I know there are other questions, but, but since you mentioned, I want to also stress the Bavarian identity of those Jews. They were not just Germans and they were not just Jewish. They were also Bavarians. And there is the story of the famous, uh, famous family in Munich, the Orthodox as well, was the Feuchtwanger family. Leon Feuchtwanger is, was a famous writer also in America, uh, but he was one of the most, you know, the successful best-selling authors in the 1920s. And his, he was not Orthodox, but his parents and his uncles and his grandparents were all Orthodox. They went to the Orthodox synagogue and afterwards they had on Shabbat, they had a Stammtisch, a, a table reserved for them every Saturday afternoon in the Hofbräu house, where they would sit and either have a coffee or a beer, which was of course kosher and um, Bavarian beer is very, you know, it's very pure. And of course they couldn't pay on Shabbat, so they would, you know, pay the next day. But uh, there was this report, which I just, uh, this, this letter, uh, which I saw from a member of the same family in Berlin. And when they came to Munich, here's what they say. Uh, one of the Feuchtwangers from Berlin. In Munich, I had extensive family, the Feuchtwanger clan, which was mostly Orthodox. Not only were its members culturally German, they were downright Bavarian. One need only have heard prayers pronounced in Hebrew with an upper Bavarian accent to know how much that was the way. The way. One would go to the beer cellars. One, would, could, one could bring one's din dinner along. That's right. If, even today, if you go to a beer garden or beer cellar, you can bring your own dinner. You only have to drink their beer or their drinks. Um, one clambered up the mountains, knew the museums like one's own home, and it was our Munich in which even the Jew from Berlin was regarded as a foreigner. So uh, that is important to understand too. And of course, Eisner and most of the others, they were all German Jews, but they were not from Bavaria. Right, uh, the Bavarian is such, a, such an important, really, really critical point. I have lots more questions, but we also have a lot that have come in. So I'm going to start um, with some of them and maybe I'll save one of mine for the end. Um, so Dr. Uh, Rory Horowitz, who was our visiting scholar um, as a, a, in theater this semester, the director and the actor, he asks, is it true that many Jews, um, he, he said he once heard about a third of them actually voted for Hitler in the hope that once he was appointed, he would fail and disappear. Uh, no, I don't think that is true. I don't think Jews voted for Hitler. Um, there were a few Jews who voted for other uh, right-wing parties, uh, very right-wing parties. One of them, uh, you know, it was even allied with uh, or tried to bring them to power. But for the Nazi party, I mean, sure, there were, you know, crazies everywhere but but i don't think uh, i mean jews did not vote for the nazi party they could not even if they wanted they would not be allowed to be members of the party and i think even the most right-wing jews in weimar germany did not wish hitler to become chancellor um there were other there were some who in 1933 tried to arrange somehow their new existence uh, with with the Nazi regime, but that didn't mean they would vote for him. I, I, I you know, we, we we can't prove or disprove it because we don't have exact numbers how every Jew voted. But uh, I, I think there were only a very 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 indivi few individuals who would do that. I I mean I, I agree. I'm not a historian of German uh, of German history, but I also my my sense is always they thought that. It, whatever the Jews thought is that they thought that once he had the realities of power, his extremism would be curbed, and that didn't that of course didn't happen. Yeah. I, I think to 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 add to that, the problem, of course, not were not the Jews, but the problem were those conservative politicians who thought, as they would say, we would contain Hitler, we would okay. control him, we would, you know, I mean, with all the differences we have. There are those people who in the Republican Party today. So we can control Trump, but Trump controls the Republican Party, right? 
And the same was true there. People said, oh, we can control Hitler. He would be moderate. We, no, they couldn't. Hitler, in the end, did exactly what he wanted to do. And all of those people who tried to contain the Nazi party to make him more moderate, um, they had no chance of doing this. That actually leads into a number of questions that have come forward, var variations on a on number of questions is, you know, um, Dave R. writes, history may not repeat itself, but it does rhyme. Uh, what lessons should we learn for today from this history? And Jill Gray is asking if you see parallels between Munich, between the wars and the packing of the courts in the U.S. with conservatives and the election of Trump. Yeah, I actually use that sentence too. History does not, in my book, does not repeat itself, but it does rhyme. I, I did write a piece in the Washington Post after January 6th last year, where I kind of suggested that the differences are, abs I mean, there's so many differences between the US and USA in 2021 uh, or 22 is not Germany in 1923 or 1933. But history does rhyme, that is, to that is correct. And I think uh, when we look at uh, a political insurrection to, to uh, attack the democratic structures of a state, um, we have, if we learn anything from this history, we have to learn to take this seriously and act against those who try to act against the democratic structures of this state. And I, I think that happened last year. Yeah and is ongoing at the moment. Right. Uh, we have, we have a, a great question from Susan Suleiman, the wonderful scholar. Um, you had mentioned Nathan the Wise, which actually some people be, will know is actually being performed at Theater J in Washington this, um, this spring. She wants to know, could you say more about cultural manifestations that the Nazis opposed in the 1920s? Um, and she also wants to know who directed the Nathan the Wise film, if you happen to know that. Um. Yeah, I, I, it's in the book, but now I, I remember. But, but the interesting thing, it was a Jewish producer, and it was actually, the, the film was uh, made in a studio in Munich, in the Bavaria, later it was called the Bavaria Studios. Um, and, um, and, and quite a few people, I believe the director as well, were Jewish. Um, but um, but it, 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 it's, an, it's really an interesting episode with Nathan the Wise. And yes, it is coming to Theater J, so everyone will have the chance to see it. But it's, the, the film was very different from the, uh, from the play, I should say, in, in its setting and everything. It was a very popular film in Berlin and in, in Munich it couldn't run. Um, and what was the other question? Cultural? About the, about the cultural manifestations that the Nazis opposed in the 1920s, so before they came to power. Yeah, um, well, I would say at this point in the early 1920s, it was mainly trying to, dis to, to be destructive of the Weimar culture that was ar arising, a, a, a liberal open culture. For example, um, there were many liberal scholars, um, Jewish scholars and others whom they attacked, some of them attacked physically. Um, and, and it was not just that, film, that movie that came to the theaters, but also plays. For example, there was a play uh, by Feuchtwanger where he describes how people uh, came into the theater and, and, and tried to disturb and disturb. So it was more this, I would say, destructive element than building their own culture. That came a little later. But of course, there were all these attempts to go back, you know, from, from modernist painting to the kind of very traditional painting or go back to what they characterized as the German medieval traditions as opposed to any kind of modernist traditions in art in other ways. And there, um, they were very much present in the media of the day, in the newspapers. There were so many daily newspapers in Munich and, 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 and in every city. Uh, but uh, if today we forget this because of you know internet and TV and radio. People didn't have that. And, and, and the daily newspaper, for example, the main one appeared three times a day. There's three editions. And, um, and, and some of the papers, by the way, I couldn't even f find in Munich, but they're here at the Library of Congress. <laughs> Shout out to our Library of Congress, such a great resource. 
Russell Bikoff has a really interesting question. You, you alluded to this very, very briefly. He wants to know about the differences and similarities with the Berlin revolutionaries. So you had mentioned Rosa Luxemburg, and he's wondering if there are Germany-wide factors influencing the events and political actors in both cities, both in Munich and in Berlin. Yeah, good question, definitely. Uh, so Berlin, um, Berlin had a kind of twofold revolution. At, at the same day, it was the very moderate social democrats and also the um, very left wing uh, wing, which later became the communists who both declared the republic. Um, it was the more moderate ones that uh, that triumphed in the end. In, in, in Munich, it was the more radical ones, but they were not communists like Eisner. Um, so that, that was different. And, and one observer, a very smart, very, very close observer, Sebastian Hafner, famous journalist, <clears throat> he wrote that all those different characters in Berlin, and there were many, um, that, that Kurt Eisner in Munich, he basically Unif United, he did everything. He, he had all the roles all of those different people in Berlin played. He played them all together. He was such a dominant figure in Munich, whereas in Berlin, you have a, a broader variety of figures. There are some Jewish figures among them, uh, but none as prominent. And of course, Rosa Luxemburg, but she never became a leader. And then she was also, <clears throat> of course, assassinated, but, um, but she, she never had a position of power. And um, and so there was nobody like Eisner in Berlin who happened to be uh, Jewish. And yes, there was actually for a short period also a Jewish prime minister in Prussia. That's right. He was just not such a prominent figure. <coughs> Sorry. <clears throat> um, so I we're getting close to the end of time, and I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you the final question. But it's actually come up also come up in some of the things that people have asked about. You mentioned in your talk, and I actually marked it when I read the manuscript, that about one of your most depressing finds was that the, those cache of letters, the anti-Semitic letters that were directed at Eisner. And you used the word both in the book and the talk, you called them depressing. And this something that struck me over the course also of this series, since we're concluding this series, that so many of us are historians of the Jewish community and we write about Judaism, we write about religion, we write about the community, we write about culture, but more and more we seem to be turning to writing about anti-Semitism. And when I think back on your books, I also think that anti-Semitism is a major, obviously major theme of this book in a way that it has not been in some of your earlier books. Would you want to that? Yeah, you, you, you're absolutely right. Uh, if I think even the titles, so my first book was called The Renaissance of Jewish Culture in Weimar Germany. Another was about revival of Jewish life after the Holocaust in Germany, or the ones in Israel. It, so you're right, this is the first one which really deals with, with anti-Semitism. And I guess it has something to do with reflecting our own times where anti-Semitism, unfortunately, is so much uh, um, has become so much, you know, of a topic again, forefront again. Um, we can't escape that, and maybe subconsciously that played a role. Uh, I, I also want to say that, um, as in concluding the series, um, I mentioned this, you know, all of those anti-Semitic incidents in Munich between 1919 and 23. Well, compared with what we heard from Jeffrey Weidlinger in Eastern Europe, the pogroms that with, with, with uh, the thousands, many thousands of, of, of casualties, you know, it was nothing. Compared to that, you still had so many East European Jews who fled to places like Munich because they felt safe. It's all relative. Uh, what is clear is that Munich was no longer and, and that holds true for all of Germany, but Munich especially was no longer as safe as it felt before World War I. So it was a gradual deterioration. It wasn't like all happening in 1933. And when I look at these letters coming to Eisner, I mean, they are really, some of them are anonymous, some of them are even where the author puts his name on. And, and they're are, they are written in, in, you know, also in difficult language often, not even totally comprehensible. And by the way, I really want to 
thank my wonderful translator, Jeremiah Riemer. I hope he's with us today. Uh, he did such a great job in, in, in bringing these letters into some, you know, uh, understandable English language. If we're in German, they aren't always comprehensible. Um, so yes, it is, it, anti-Semitism is very much present, but compared to what we have in Eastern, what we see in Eastern Europe, it, it paled, it was still um, very modest. And the majority of Jews, even in Munich, maybe less than in Berlin, but even Munich felt still pretty safe and for sure it was a passing phenomenon. And that's the hard question, uh, which I might pose at the end. When do we recognize that things are really going wrong? They're really going the wrong direction. We might not be able to even uh, bring them back. When is it? Is it a, an attack on a synagogue with many victims? I mean, many people claim today that German Jews were blind and they didn't see the future. Nobody know, nobody knew in 1923 that 1933 was coming and Hitler was coming back. That was not unavoidable. And we don't know what's coming in 10 years. So I don't want to be um, um, a prophet of doom, but I think that we all have to realize German Jews in the 20s also did not, were not able to foresee um, the future. And, and we have to be very careful too. We don't know what's happening in this country and in the world uh, with this unfortunate rise of anti-Semitism. That is a sobering, sad, and scary place to end, but also a very appropriate place because as we all know, historians, we know a great deal about the past, but we don't know anything about the future. But hopefully the past, reading the past will inform the future. I wanna thank you so much, Professor Brenner, for joining us today for this marvelous lecture. I want to recommend the book to everyone who is on this series and remind you that while this concludes our series on Europe's Jews, before the Holocaust, we start a new series in two weeks on Israeli writers of today. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye.